Well, we're going to read it together as a family. It's in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 28 and 29. Before we read it, can I just thank God for all of our social global family that's watching literally from around the world. Come on to all of the inmates that are watching on the Pando app, our brothers and sisters who are part of our social family. And y'all, right now, right now, right now, we have serve team that were at the Echo location for the soft launch. Next Sunday, we will be one church in two locations, y'all. Uh, what Churches are closing down. Your church is growing and expanding. One church in two locations. It's a big deal. You better see what we've got. So starting next Sunday, Super Bowl Sunday, you can pick. You can come here to Fair Park or you can go to the Echo location. Their service is at 1030 and it's going to be awesome. But let's read our scripture together. Anybody got it memorized? Come on, you got to memorize this. If you got to memorize, go on the gram or something and just, and let me see, let me see. I want to see if you got to memorize. I'll, I'll repost it. There's something powerful. My kids, my kids almost got to memorize. Remy, right here on the front row, she's got to memorize. She was saying it in the house the other day. But come on, by the end of the year, you'll have it memorized. Let's read it together. You ready? Do you see what we've got? An unshakable kingdom. And do you see how thankful we must be? Not only thankful, but brimming with worship, deeply reverent before God. For God is not an indifferent bystander. He's actively cleaning house, torching all that needs to burn. And he won't quit until it's all cleansed. God himself is fire. Oh, it sounds good. That sounds better every week. I love when y'all do that. Himself. You got to say that part with your chest. Himself is fire. L last week, I talked about being thankful. Do you see how thankful we must be? Can you put it back up there? I, I love that scripture. Can you put it back? Yeah. Watch this. Watch this. It says, not only thankful, but brimming with, with what? Brimming with worship. How many of you would like to be brimming with worship? Can I see how you like to? For real? You, you want to be brimming with worship? All right. I'm going to ask you that later. Um, go with me to Genesis chapter 22 real quick. After this, you can sit down, I promise. Genesis 22. And this is where we're going to get our thoughts from today. Starting at verse number one, it says, Sometime later, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah, sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac, and when he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, Listen to what he says. Stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship. And then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac. And he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, father. Yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and the wood are here, Isaac said. But where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. When they reached the place God had told them about, Abraham built an altar and there he arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up and there in a thicket, he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the place 
the Lord will provide. And to this day, it is said, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. Can you say amen? That's, that's a whole lot of scripture and a heavy passage brimming with worship. And Abraham said, me and my son are going to worship. I want to preach today using this as a title, The Song That Never Ends. The Song That Never Ends. Would you look at your neighbor one last time again, whichever one you like the best, and just say, neighbor, there is a song that never ends. Let me see where some older people are. Look at your other neighbor and say, other neighbor, I'm telling you there's a song that never ends. It just goes on and on. My friends, some people started. Okay, stop, stop, stop. If you Gen Z, you don't even know what that is. Because you're too young. Uh, let's pray before we jump into this word. Then you can chillax. Long prayer. Bear with me. Uh, God, you're awesome. Please speak to us today. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. The song that never ends. Can I see your hand one more time if this is your first time ever to Social Dallas? Can I see your hand? Come on, make some more noise for them. I, I don't ever want to take that for granted. I'm thankful. So a whole lot of churches in DFW. I'm glad you pulled up to Social. The song that never ends. Believe it or not, one of the things that is distinctive and unique about our faith is that we don't just gather together to hear the teaching of the Word of God. We don't just gather together to join in prayer, but we also gather together to sing. Christians, believers, are a singing people. I don't know whether you know this or not, but Muslims don't gather together to sing. Hindus don't gather together to sing. Buddhists, although they have chants, they don't typically gather together to lift up their voices in unison to sing. But as believers, singing together in worship is integral to our gathering. I you to think about it. Of the 52 Sundays we will gather this year, you will not just hear the preaching of the word of God, but before somebody gets up to preach the word, how many of you know we are going to fill whatever space and whatever place we gather in with singing, with praise, with worship, with clapping, with jumping, and with shouting. I told you all the time that social is one of the only churches that you will close your rings on your fitness app. Because we are going to praise and we're going to sing exuberantly. I know some of you are thinking, you know, PR, th that ain't me. That ain't me. I mean, I come to social and uh, I, I don't do the whole singing thing. The whole singing thing is really not my thing. That's really for the praise team to do. That's, I, I sit and I spectate and I watch them, you know, for 17 minutes. I watch them sing. And perhaps if they sing a song that I like, I might be moved enough to sing just a little bit. Or maybe I'll just lift up one hand. But singing is not really what I do. That's, that, that's not my thing. That's, that's for them. And if that's what you say, uh, first of all, I love you. But maybe that's why you don't get a breakthrough. Because something powerful happens whenever you actually lift up your voice with other believers and you begin to sing. Understand, in your Bible, there are over 400 scriptures on singing and on praise. And a multiplicity of those scriptures are commanding you to sing. Not suggesting commanding that you sing. The Bible says in Psalm 96 that you should sing praises to the Lord. It says in Psalm 33, 3, sing a new song to the Lord. Matter of fact, the longest book in the Bible is a book of songs because God does not suggest that you sing to him. He commands that you lift up your voice and you sing to him. He didn't say sing if you feel like it. He didn't say sing if you're having a good day. He didn't say sing if you're on key, off key, or around the key. He commands you to lift up your voice and sing because something happens in your spirit and in the atmosphere whenever you begin to sing to God. Not only that, God sings over you. 
Can you give us the scripture? Uh Uh-huh, Zephaniah 317 says that God rejoices over us with singing. Think about that, that we sing to God, but God even sings a song over you. And albeit like our God, to command you to do something that he will do himself because something happens whenever you sing a truth. There's something about stating a truth, but there's something totally different about singing a truth. I can state a truth and I can say something, but there's a huge difference between stating a truth and singing a truth. This is how God has wired our bodies and our brains. When you begin to sing a truth, that truth begins to seep down into your soul. When you lift up your hands and do it, it's like you're becoming what you're singing and we rehearse the truth of who God is by singing because whatever truth you sing will seep into your soul. This is a principle that is not just sacred, it's secular. Some of y'all got, a, y'all got truths in your soul that, that you've been singing and, and they, they tricked you because they put the truth to melody and it's stuck in your soul. It's stuck in your soul. Okay, let me try. Um, let me try this. Uh, uh, mm, let me think, let me think. Uh, uh, uh. Best part of waking up. When the last time you had some Folgers coffee? <laughs> You know your bougie coffee drinking self ain't had no Folgers in a long time, but you still know, according to their truth, that the best part of waking up is Folgers in your... You know how long ago that commercial was? But that truth has seeped down into your soul. I could do this all day. Nationwide. Some of y'all ain't even got insurance. But they have gotten this truth. down in your soul that nationwide is on your side this is the power of singing praises to God it's not enough for me to just say my God is great that's powerful but it's something different when I sing how great is our God how, when you start doing that, it's different. It gets in your soul. It's one thing to say that God is the rock of ages. That is a powerful truth to declare. But whenever I start lifting up my voice with you, especially when I'm going through, and I just start from my spirit saying, Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand. Truth has gotten in your soul when you sing. And hear me, I love singing. Singing is powerful. I love lifting up my voice to God and not caring who thinks about what I'm saying. I just love to sing. The only problem is that singing is an expression of worship. It is not the full definition of worship. I think most of us, when we read our verse of the year and we heard brimming with worship, you thought brimming with singing. That's why you're like, oh yeah, I want to brim. But I came to tell you, That singing is an expression of worship. It is not the full definition of worship. Worship is much deeper than that. And here's the reality I found in my own life. It is very easy for me to lift up a song to God. Oh, I have no problem lifting up a song. I'm telling you, I will lift up a song. I will lift up my hands. I have no problem singing a song because singing a song doesn't place a demand on my life. Singing a song doesn't really require a sacrifice. So what do you do, ladies and gentlemen? When the worship God wants is not singing, but the worship he wants is for you to give him the thing that you want to hold on to the most. What do you do when God says the worship that I want is not the song that you sing on Sunday, but it is the life that you live. He says, I want the thing that your fingers are holding so tightly and you say, God, you can have everything else. Yes, I'll sing, but you can't have this. What happens when God defines worship? By asking for the thing that your heart desires. I dare say to you that there are some people who come to church and sang songs and you think you worshiped, but you didn't. Because if you sang the song, but you didn't give God the thing that he asked for. You were just giving lip service. What you did was Christian karaoke. Worship is deeper than that. And often God will ask you to let go of the thing that you were holding so tightly. I love what Corey Ten Boom, the Holocaust survivor and writer of The Hiding Places said. She said, I have learned to hold all things loosely so that God will not have to pry them out of my hands. I have learned to hold all things loosely 
so that God will not have to pry them out of my hands. In other words, it is easy to lift up your hands on Sunday, but true worship is living with loose hands on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, saying, God, whatever you want, if you're asking it, I'll give it to you. Brimming with worship is easy if it's just singing, but am I brimming with worship with a yes when God asks me for something? This is the tenor of the text in Genesis chapter 22. And to be honest, what drew me to this passage of scripture that we read is something that you have to understand if you're ever going to become a student of God's word. If you're ever going to be a student of God's word, you have to learn this principle of Bible study called the law of first mention. The law of first mention. And law of first mention is this. It's when you find the first time that a word is used in the Bible and you use that as the starting definition. When you search for a word and you find the first time it is mentioned in the Bible, use that as your starting definition. And the thing that blew my mind is that the first time we see the word worship in the Bible, the first time you ever read worship in the Bible, understand that there is no stage, there is no microphone, there is no guitar, there are no praise singers, there is no Nord, there is nothing musical at all. The first time you hear the word worship is what we read in Genesis chapter 22. The first time worship is mentioned is with a hundred year old father named Abraham and his teenage son and him saying, I'm going up this mountain to worship when God told him to sacrifice his son. Notice his language. He does not say, I'm going up this mountain to kill my son because I serve this crazy, sadistic God that asked me to do so. No, 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 no. He says, I'm going up this mountain and I'm going to worship. Y'all, I'm going to be honest. I was stressing this week because this is without a doubt one of the hardest biblical passages to exegete or to preach or to even wrap your mind around the fact that God would even ask Abraham to do this. This is one of those passages that make you uncomfortable comfortable and might put some little theological consternation and I dare say even constipation in your spirit because in this text the God of the promise is the problem the God of the promise is the problem and we really don't know what to do with passages like this because it's easy when it's a clear devil to fight Oh, come on, somebody. If, if this was the devil coming around Isaac, we would know what to do. And if he was trying to take Isaac away, we'd be like, uh-uh, Abraham, we know what to do. You better just intercede and say, devil, back up off of my child. We know what to do when it's the devil. But, but, but the devil is not in this. This is God that is asking of something. It almost reminds me of our Savior, Jesus, when you begin to look at his fight with the enemy in the wilderness versus his fight with God. God in Gethsemane. There's a difference between the fight in the wilderness and the fight in Gethsemane. Because in the fight in the wilderness, you're fighting the devil. You remember what happened? He fasted 40 days and 40 nights. Come on, remember that? Fasted 40 days, 40 nights. Four, 40 days and 40 nights. Come on, y'all. We did 21 and some of y'all cheated on day two. 40 day, No condemnation, no condemnation. 40 days he has fasted. 40 days and 40 nights, and right after the fast, look at the strategic, pointed, specific attack of the enemy. He just finished fasting. Turn these stones into bread. As soon as he finished fasting, and look at your Savior, right after the enemy said that and tempted him, he said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Oh, I love that scene because everything the enemy threw at him, come on, it was like he was playing pickleball. He was just hitting them right back, hitting them with the word of God. Every temptation that came against Jesus, he defeated the temptation by quoting the word of God. Let me pause right there and tell somebody, are you fighting with the right weapon? You could actually win more battles if you got the word of God in you because the way you fight temptation, oh, it's not by willpower, it's by word power. You better get some of this word in you and start eating the word of God so you have something to fight back against the enemy when he comes your way every temptation Jesus thwarted and stopped with the word of God and he finished it to the point the devil was like oh I gotta go away but in the garden of Gethsemane this is a different fight because there is no devil this is God saying go to the cross it is my will to crush you for all of humanity you can't pray the cross away. And Jesus 
although he had the emotions and the pain saying, I don't want to do this. He finally gets to the place that every believer will have to get to. He says, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. And the reason why everybody's quiet and nobody wants to shout that, because you think God's will is always for you to get a raise and get a Tesla and to go tiptoeing through the tulips and Kool-Aid to come out of your water fountain. But that's not what produces resilience in you. Often God will take you through suffering. Can I ask you something? Oh, does God always ask you to do the things you want to do? You saying no, but that's what a lot of us think. If God always asks you to do the things you want to do, I want to suggest that you ain't following God, you're following you. Because God will often ask you to give something up, to do the very thing that you don't want to do. He will ask you to forgive the person that says something so sideways on your profile page and he'll say, bless him. He'll ask you to do something you don't want to do and this is where Abraham is. He's being asked to give up the thing that he loves the most. Now, one thing I want to note just to help some of you in here today, there is a cultural nuance that we are not aware of in this text because understand that Abraham's culture, within that culture, there were already different people groups that actually practiced sacrificing their children. That's why God even condemns it in the Old Testament, that they, they practiced sacrificing. Not only that, Abraham would have had a framework in that culture that the firstborn already belongs to God. Now, I'm in no way, shape, or form trying to mitigate the severity of what God is asking him to do, but you have to understand this is a different culture where they already understood that the firstborn belongs to God. Is his anyway the firstborn child the firstborn cattle everything first is his because God wants what is first he wants what is best so it wasn't completely outrageous for this request to be made you're dealing with a different culture but that does not negate the fact that Abraham has been asked to do something different and the question that Abraham had to be grappling with is God why now why would you ask me to give this up now why in the world would you let me go through 75 years with my wife Sarah of not being able to have the thing that my heart wanted the most to have a child? Why would you let me experience the pain, the shame of years of watching everybody else have their child and going to other people's baby showers and sitting there saying I'll never have anybody to pass on my legacy to? Why would you let me go through 75 years of that shame and that pain and then all of a sudden show up and get my heart excited with a promise that I I will have a seed and then wait 25 more years for it to come to pass and then finally at a hundred years old when I finally get the baby and he's grown and I have memories with him and now you're asking me to give it up why would you ask me to do it now you shouldn't have gave me the child in the first place why now and maybe you're in a why now season where God is asking you something and you're trying to figure out God why now? And perhaps the answer that we need to understand is the right in the text that Abraham got in verse number one. Here's the why. It's in verse number one. Sometime later, God who did what? Tested, tested Abraham. Why, God? Because you're in a test. Abraham, welcome to your final exam. You are in a test. Now, let's be clear. God does not tempt us, but he does test us. James chapter 1 verses 13 and 15. Can I just teach Bible just for a little bit? It says, let no man say when he is tempted, he's being tempted by God. For God does not tempt anybody with evil, nor does he tempt anyone. God does not tempt anybody with evil, but God will test you. He will test you. Because how many you know, a faith that has not been tested cannot be trusted. It's easy to say, oh, he's Jehovah Jireh, my provider, when you got the bonus and you got the company car and everything's going well. Of course, it's easy to shout and praise God. The question is, can you say he's Jehovah Jireh, my provider, when you got an eviction notice? Can you say he's Jehovah Jireh, my provider, when they say, hey, we're downsizing? Can you say he's Jehovah Jireh and still praise when you're in the unemployment line? Anybody can praise God if you got a clean bill of health, but can you still praise God with the same passion when they find a lump in your breast and they don't know what it is can you still praise them when the cancer is spread that is the test God does not tempt us with evil but he sure will test and Abraham is going through a test and I hear some of y'all you're like APR I don't like tests I got test anxiety so God can go ahead and pass me with the test I don't want to test and I want to take you back to school 
You remember school when you had a test? Remember school when you had a test? Oh, y'all didn't graduate? Remember? <laughs> y'all just there. Some of y'all like, <laughs> did you go to school? <laughs> remember the test? Here's what I love about school. You know what my favorite day of school was? The first day. I love the first day of school. Because the first day of school, the assignment is clear. It's the outfit. It's the outfit. <laughs> That's what the first day of school is about, and the syllabus, and the syllabus. But the first day of school is about your outfit, and I love the first day because no teacher, I dare say, in the history of teaching has ever given a test on the first day. You don't get a test on the first day of school. That's why I love the first day of school. You know the reason a teacher does not give you a test on the first day? It's evil to give a test on the first day. You are not a good teacher if you give me a test on the first day because you cannot test me on what you have not imparted to me. Some of y'all gonna get it in a minute. If I'm going to be tested, something has to be imparted. Now, if it's three weeks in or in the middle of semester, you are well within your right to give me a test. And if I flunk, that's my bad. I'm the one that was falling asleep during your lesson. I'm the one that didn't study. But you can't give me a test on the first day because if I'm going to be tested, something first has to be imparted. I'm trying to show you how to shout when God takes you through a test. God wouldn't let you go through the test if he hadn't already imparted some type of strength on the inside of you for the test. The reason you can handle the test is because God gave you the strength that you needed for that test. And I want to prophesy over somebody who's going through a test right now. You are not going to lose your mind. You are not going to commit suicide. You are not going to end up in depression. The reason you still stand it is because God already gave you everything you need for the test that you in. Oh, I feel God right there. Somebody needs to take at least a 10 second praise break and just thank God that he's already given me the strength for the test. I got the shoulders for this burden. How you still standing? Because I got the strength for the test. How you still lifting up your hands? I would have lost my mind. Yeah, you would have, but he already graced me for this test. <laughs> Baby, I've been graced for this test. You know why I can smile while you walk away? Because I've already been through that test. I've watched other people walk away and I thought it was going to kill me. But when they walked away and I was still here, when I realized that my purpose didn't have to be connected to them, I realized God already graduated me from that test so I can take on the new one. Y'all recording this? I'm going to watch it later. It's blessing me. I was graced for this test. Abraham was grace for this test. God wouldn't have gave him the test if he wasn't grace for it. He got the first test in Genesis 12. That was his first 12 test, remember? He said to him, go to a land I will show you. The first test was leave your family. <laughs> that was his first test. Read it when you get to the crib. Abraham was like, say less. I don't like them anyway, I'm out. <laughs> you know he was ready to go because God said, go to a place I will show you. He's like, you ain't gonna tell me, I'm gone, wherever it is. <laughs> he passed that test to step out in faith to a land I will show you. That's all throughout Abraham's life. I will show you. When are you gonna show me? I, I will. <laughs> when? When I do. <laughs> See, y'all don't like that right there because you need your 15 year plan. And you wonder why you're stuck in life. And you wonder why God's not speaking. Maybe God's not moving his lips because you ain't moving your life. When you move your life, God will move his lips. <laughs> when you start taking a step, God says, okay, now you obey. Now I'll start speaking to you. But if you're waiting for him to lay it out crystal clear, you're going to be stuck and waste years of your life. God will move his lips when you move your life. What's the directive? Go. All right. And here we go. He passed, he passed the test of breaking up from a toxic relationship with Lot. You know those people that you feel bad for and you keep connected to you and you know they ain't supposed to be connected to you and they're a parasite and they're stealing the life from you because you got a savior complex. You just keep them around and everybody around you, Stevie Wonder can see that they are draining you. But you're like, no, you don't understand. I need to help them. He went through that test. God says, separate from Lot. Passed that test. Here comes the next test. Can you trust me for the promise when it takes a long time to come to pass? He failed that test. He failed it bad. He failed it so bad. Him and his wife, Sarah, failed it so bad. They said, maybe, 
Maybe this is the craziest thing I've ever heard. Maybe we'll talk about this craziness next, next week in the relationship series because I ain't never seen nothing crazy like this. They were like, oh, maybe God meant the promise was going to come through you, but not through me, Sarah. So let me get this, <laughs> this side chick, <laughs> Hagar, <laughs> and you go ahead and you sleep with her. And maybe that's how God will get the promise to come to pass. And that's what they did. It sounds crazy, but before you laugh, can you check yourself before you wreck yourself? <laughs> And think about the crazy things that you did trying to help the promise of God come to pass in your life. Anytime you're trying to help hurry the promise of God, you produce an Ishmael. That's what Ishmael was. Ishmael is Abraham and Sarah helping God bring the promise to pass. Ooh, if I had time, I'd talk about the Ishmaels. Some of y'all dating an Ishmael. Because <laughs> you don't want to wait for the promise. So I'd rather stick with, okay. <laughs> Ishmael is so much easier when God is taking too long. And Abraham and Sarah failed that test, but thank God for his grace. Because as they waited, they waited, they waited. And at a hundred years old with dentures, here they come with their baby boy. Do you know what it's like to get the thing you've been believing God for? To pray and believe. I'm talking about to be struggling financially, to pray and believe for the business, and then the business pops off. Do you know what that feeling is like? To be hoping for God to do something, to hope and hope year after year, and to finally see the fruition of something that you've wanted your entire life? It's a beautiful feeling. And right after that feeling, God brings another test. Now the test is, do you love the promise or the promise giver? Are you more in love with the blessing than you are with the blesser? That's the test. The test is, can you give up the thing that your heart wanted the most even after God gave it to you? Ladies and gentlemen, all of us would love to say, of course I would give it up. He's my savior. He's worthy of it. Oh, but you don't know what you would give up until he asks you for it. And there's many of us who are worshiping, but all we're given is a song because we haven't learned to live with loose hands. We're holding on to what we want so bad that God can't even ask us for it. This is why some people don't ever come to faith in Jesus. There's some of you, you want to come to faith in Jesus, but you're like, but what am I going to have to give up? God, I'll come to you, hey, but don't touch my money. God, I'll come to you, but don't mess with my dreams. Don't mess with the, how I saw my life playing out. Don't mess with that. And whatever you say, God, I'll come to you, but don't mess with this. Whatever that is, that is your God. That is what you worship. When it comes to worship, the question is not if you are going to worship. The question is what you are going to worship. All of us are worshipers, and Abraham has come to the test where God says, can I have that? I know you waited your whole life for this baby boy, but can I have it? It's funny, we sing these songs, and the whole point of this message is that it's more than a song. We sang it today, I think. Didn't we sing it today? You are worthy of it. I just told you there's power in singing and that's what you're gonna give me. <laughs> Let's try one more again. You are worthy of it. You are worthy of it. For from you and there it is right there. That's the hard part. I didn't want to get to you deserve the glory yet. Because we sing, you are worthy of it all. 
and we love, for from you are all things. Don't you love when God just gives you what you've been believing for? This is the song every believer says, oh, from you are all things. Keep singing it, team. From you are all things. From you are all things. Oh, I finally got the bonus. From you are all things. Oh, my dream came to pass. From you are all things. Oh, my video went finally went viral. Oh, from you are all things. I won the lotto. From you are all things. They finally said yes to go on a date. From you that's what we want. It's that. That to. Who? That to you? Because that to you says, God, even if you gave it and I love it, if you ask for it back, that's my worship to give it to you. Abraham is in the test of true worship. And I want you to see how quickly he responds. I'm almost done. Look at it in verse number three. Look at what Abraham does. God tells him, give me your son. Give me the one that you love. I love how specific, if I had time. I love how specific, he said, give me your son, your one and only son. And then he finally says, Isaac. <laughs> you know how God has to get specific with us? Because I'm, I'm convinced he had to be specific. Because he'd been like, oh, you want Ishmael? Oh, I'll give you Ishmael. <laughs> take him. <laughs> you know how you do, you want to give God the stuff that, you don't wanna, that he don't want. Now take him when you want him. I'll FedEx Ishmael to you. God had to be specific. Now, the one you love, <laughs> Isaac. So g g give me Isaac. But even after you ask for it, look at what happened. Please don't miss this. Early the next morning, y'all. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. Early the next morning. No wonder he in the hall of faith. God says, can I have it? And the next, y'all, I'm going to keep it 100. I preach the gospel. I love him. But if he asks me or something like that, I'm sleeping in the next day. <laughs> oh, I'm sleeping in until at least 6 o'clock. And then I'm going to pray about it and say, I don't know. I just got to really discern whether. Well, can y'all agree with me? I'm just trying to figure out if he really meant Isaac. Because I don't know. It might be Ishmael. Early the next morning, look at not just the obedience, the immediate obedience. See, there's something powerful about the immediate obedience because the late obedience is still disobedience. Abraham has got to a place with God where he says, okay, early. I, gotta get, I can't even sleep in. Early the next morning. See, some of you are waiting for understanding before you get obedience. But God doesn't work like that. In the kingdom of God, it's when you obey, then you get understanding. That's how the kingdom of God works. Some of you are waiting for understanding and you say, God, when you make it clear, then I'll obey. And that's why you've been stuck in the same space in life for years. God says, no, you give me your obedience and as you obey, then I'll give you understanding. Ooh, y'all got to help me. I feel this thing. I had no, un we had no understanding in planning, th planning this church. It made no sense. Y'all, I was chilling. I, I was traveling. Do you know how beautiful it is to travel all over the world and preach to a church and then leave? Like literally be like, pastor, take care of all them issues. Just preach fire down and be like, you got to shepherd them. <laughs> it made no sense to start. I shut down everything. I was doing good. And God said, I want you to plant a church and call it social. I was fighting. I was like, are you sure? Thank God for a godly wife. We'll talk about that next week. <laughs> he was like, this is the will of the Lord. I said, I don't know. Let me keep praying. You sure you don't want Ishmael? <laughs> Some of you are waiting for the understanding to perceive the obedience, but that's not how God works. Look at what he did. Put it back up there. It says the next morning he got up. Oh, this is my favorite. Just, just a little nugget. It says when he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God told him about. Uh, some scholars suggest that there was not enough wood in the region of Moriah where God called him to go. So Abraham, it says, I'm going to go ahead and cut up the wood now so that when I get to the place, I don't have the excuse. So I don't get there and go, well, Lord, I tried. Ain't enough wood. I guess we got to go back. <laughs> Look at how deep his obedience is that he's cut up the wood before the journey. And now he is with his son on a three-day journey to the place that God is going to show him. Can you imagine the memories that are flooding his mind as he walks with his son, thinking of the day he was born, thinking of times that he spent with them, knowing that as he's walking, 
the death sentence has already started. I have children. I can't imagine the memories that would be flooding my mind. I don't think I could do it, but look at Abraham walking for three days in complete obedience. Abraham understands that the song that never ends is the song of obedience. Anybody can sing during a 15-minute worship set. But can you sing the song that will never end? And the song that will never end is the song of obedience, living a lifestyle of saying, whatever you want me to do, Lord, the answer is yes before you ask it. And God says, if you're just content with worshiping on Sunday and not giving me your life, you're just singing karaoke. Keep your song. But the song that will never end is the song of obedience. And right when you obey one time, guess what? You get another lesson of obedience. And then another chance to obey him. And you will spend all your life singing the song that will never end. The true worship song of obedience. Oh, come here, Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 12. That's why he says, I urge you in view of God's mercy to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to him. This is your spiritual act of worship. A living sacrifice. That means every single day. It's not a one-time thing. Otherwise, he would have said a dead sacrifice, which I would prefer because that means just one time. <laughs> No, he says, every day, surrendering your flesh, saying, God, here I am. I want you to see in verse number five what happens. He said to his servants, once he got to the place, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there and we will worship. What is worship? Obeying what he told you. No microphone, no stage, no fog machine, but I'm still going to worship because my worship is the song that'll never end. It's the song of obedience. But do you notice what he says in the second clause? This is the one that made me start shouting at the crib. He says, uh, we will worship and then we will come back to you. Excuse me? <laughs> Abraham, maybe you didn't understand the assignment. God said, take your son and sacrifice him. He should have said, we're going to go worship and I'll be back. He should have pulled a terminator. I'll be back. What is he talking about? We will come back to you. Why has Abraham gotten to a place of a we? That we shows me that Abraham has been paying attention to the test. Abraham has been paying attention in class. That we lets me know that Abraham knows the history of his God. Whenever you start hearing we talk, that is faith talk because he did not have confidence that it was going to happen, but faith is actually knowing it's going to happen and speaking it before it actually happens. He said we will return. I don't know how we're going to return, but we are going to return. See, Abraham started thinking about what God did when he wasn't able to produce a son and he reasoned in his mind that if God can raise a dead womb like Sarah and raise my dead body then maybe God can just raise a dead boy too so I'm gonna be obedient and sing the song that never ends but please believe I'm trusting that this God who is the God who can do the impossible I'm trusting that he can resurrect this boy back to life why because I watched him resurrect a dead womb and if he did it before he can do it again. I'm trying to tell you why you can have confidence in your God. If he's opened up a door before, he can open up a door again. If he's healed you before, he can heal you again. If he's provided for you before, he can provide for you again. I need somebody that's got some history with God just to give him a we praise. We means I believe. I believe that God is able.
to resurrect this boy even if I lay it down. The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away, but blessed be the name of the Lord. Woo! You want to be unshakable? Start living your life like that. Have some we talk. We says, I have a history with God. And I know if he did it before, he can do it again. Some of you are like, well, that's you. you just shouting, preacher. You got any scripture for that? I shall do. Hebrews chapter 11. The writer of Hebrews lets us know what Abraham was thinking. He says, it was by faith that Abraham offered Isaac as a sacrifice when God was testing him. Abraham, who had received God's promises, was ready to sacrifice his only son, Isaac, even though God had told him, Isaac is the son through whom your descendants will be counted. Abraham reasoned, he reasoned, he thought about it, that if Isaac died, God was able to bring him back to life again. Oh, don't tell me that I'm crazy. Don't tell me that walking with God is making me lose my mind. I, I, I reasoned I, if he did it before. Faith is not logical. It doesn't make sense. But it's also not illogical. I got a history with God. Faith is theological. It's theological. In other words, I see all the facts but I also know who my God is and what he's able to do. I see the scenario and the situation clearly. I don't got my head in the sand. I just know that when God enters in the equation, walls fall down when you shout, Red Sea start to split, all kinds of things can happen. He reasoned God was able. Watch this, he puts the wood on Isaac. The Bible feels the need to tell us that on the third day, Isaac carried the wood up the mountain. And Moses had, I'm sorry, Abraham had the knife in the fire. When they get to the place, Isaac, the only time he speaks in the passage, he looks up to his father and says, Father, I see the wood. I see the fire and the knife. But where is the lamb for the sacrifice? Think about this. If Isaac is aware enough to see that there is no lamb, but there is wood and there's fire, I believe he could have got up off that altar when Abraham tied him down. If this boy is old enough and aware enough to see, wait, wait a minute, where's the lamb? How many know when Abraham was getting ready to do it, he could say, oh, hold on, Pops, you lost your mind, not me. What in the world would make a son willingly carry the wood up a mountain? What would make a son look up at the father and say if this is your will then let it be done i'm not gonna get up off the altar i'll stay here on the excuse me cross this is a picture of what our savior did no wonder he stayed on that cross he could have gotten off he could have called a legion of angels but i want to thank god for the foreshadowing of our savior jesus pictured in isaac who willingly laid his life down for you and for me somebody ought to thank god that he willingly laid it down no man took his life he said I lay it down I'm gonna get up dad do whatever you have to do if God told you to do it I'm gonna lay here and let you do it and as Abraham got ready the angel calls Abraham Abraham stop now I know that you fear me. Not fear of being afraid, but that I'm the most important one in your life. That you reverence me. Oh, do you see how thankful we must be? Not only thankful, but brimming with worship. Deeply reverent. You haven't worshiped until you have obeyed. That's the song that'll never end. And when you give him the thing, that your heart wants to hold on to so tightly. You're saying, God, I revere you. I reverence you. 
You are the most important one in my life. You're worthy of it all. If that's what you desire, would you just lift up your hands all over this place today? I want us to sing that song, worship team, come up. I want us to sing, you are worthy of it all. But I want you to sing it with a different mindset because it's easy to sing for from you are all things. But there's something that God is asking you to give to him. And even before we pray, I want you in worship to give it to him. Can we sing that you are worthy of it all? Come on. You are worthy of it all. Father, all that we are is yours. You are worthy of it all. Come on, declare it to him today. You are worthy. You are worthy of it all. You are worthy of it all. For from you are all these. And to you are all these. You deserve the glory. Come on, turn up the volume of your worship and declare you are worthy of it all you are worthy of it all for from you are all things and to you are all things you deserve the glory Just the voices, let's declare it. You are worthy. God, make that real in our hearts. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Father, I pray today that we wouldn't just give you lip service, but God, truly from the depths of our heart, we'll sing the song that will never end, the song of obedience. God, I pray for my brother, for my sister, that there's something that you're calling them to give to you, and they know it but they're holding on to it so tightly. Father, would you give them the strength and the grace of loose hands? Not just lifted hands, but loose hands. To say like Job said, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away, but blessed be the name of the Lord. Father, thank you that there is nothing that we let go of that is as priceless as you you are the prize you are the reward so much so that when we get to eternity we will take off our crowns and our achievements because we will be in awe of your glory and your presence and we will know that you are the goal So God, I pray that over my brother and my sister. God, I pray that over me. That whatever you ask, Father, before you ask it, the answer is yes. The answer is yes. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed in this moment. I just sense this is such a holy moment for somebody. 
I feel in this moment the pain of somebody who's going, God, I don't know, I want it so bad. But I also feel the strength of the Holy Spirit coming to somebody and God saying, lay it down. Lay it down. I'm better than any dream that you thought you had, than any career. That's true worship, not just a song. So with heads bowed and eyes closed today, if you know God is speaking to you, and there's something he's saying, hey, I, I want that, give it to me, give it to me. Just as a sign of your yes, hear me, that will have to be lived out once the emotions of the service are over. Don't allow the three-day journey to make you rationalize whether you heard his voice or not. Abraham knew and he kept walking. It will be worth it. But if you know God's speaking to you and there's something he's saying, give it to me, give it to me. If that's you, would you just lift up your hand as a sign of saying, God, if if you're asking me for it, I'll give it to you. I don't know what that is for you. I do know that if he's asking you to give it up, it'll be worth it. Thank you, Jesus. Whew. Hands going up all over this place today. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that you're a trusted God. We can trust you. Thank you, God. You can put it right back down. If you're here today and you've never taken that first step, which is to say, Jesus, my life is yours. So many people have a problem with this passage because they don't understand why a God would ask Abraham to do that. Even though God stopped it. But those same people who asked that question never stopped to think that he did not stop it for his son, Jesus the one who was truly innocent, who knew no sin, was slain. The Father rejected him so that we could be accepted, so that you could have an opportunity to respond to him. How can you deny a love like that? And so with heads bowed and eyes closed, if you've never surrendered your life to Jesus, maybe you were walking with him and your heart's gotten cold and you turned away, but you hear and feel the love of the Father in this moment saying, come back home, come back home, come back home. If that's you, would you lift up your hand high enough and long enough to where I can see it, saying, I need to give him my life today. Yes, yes, yes. I see those hands. I see those hands. Thank you, Jesus. Hands are going up all over this place today. Thank you, God. Here's what I want to do. There's something powerful about movement. I said it earlier. When you obey and you move your life, I'm telling you, God will move his lips and start speaking to you. So this is not to embarrass you. There's something powerful about moving from where you are. If you lifted up your hand that second time or you should have, saying, I need to give him my life and surrender my life to him. I'm just going to ask you to be so bold and so brave. When I count to three, just come right up here to the front. Come on, you know if God's speaking to your heart one this is between you and God two don't worry about what anybody else thinks we're gonna be praising God come on three would you come I don't care if you're all the way in the back and you got to walk up to the front if you just lifted up your hand you should have I want you to come I want you to come thank you Jesus thank you Jesus come on we say it all the time you can always come home you can always come home Come on, this is not a God that's upset with you. This is a God that loves you, that cares for you. He's been waiting for this moment. He's been waiting for this moment. Come on, come on. I promise it's worth the walk. I promise it's worth the walk. I promise you it's worth the walk. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Thank you, God, that we can come just as we are. I don't have to clean myself up to come to you. Father, thank you I can come just as I am, broken, hurting, dirty. God, I can come to you. Come on, y'all. Don't stop clapping unless people stop coming. There's still some people coming today. This is why we're here. This is why we came. I'm just standing as a spokesperson of a God who loves you so much. Come on, come on, come on. 
coming all the way from the back. I promise it's worth the walk. I promise it's worth the walk. Come on. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, they're still coming. They're still coming. Anybody else? Yeah, come on, come on. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Anybody else? Do you see what we've got? Yeah, yeah. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Yeah. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. You know, we're singing that song, Do You See What We've Got, An Unshakable Kingdom, but while y'all were walking up here, I just got this thought, Do You See What You've Got? were made in the image of God there is value on your life people don't rob people unless they believe they have something of value the reason the enemy attacks the reason he comes after you is because of the value that is on you because of the call of God that is on your life see the attack through the lens of the value of what you carry do you see what you've got do you see what you've got? You were bought with a price. He laid down his life just to give you the option. And if it was just you, he would have done it just for you. The fact that you've been through so much, that there's been so much attack, some of you from the moment you were born, is because of the deposit and the value that is on your life. Thank you, God. Can you just lift up your hands like this? We're all gonna do it as one big family. Don't you let none of these bougie church people fool you. They got issues too. All of us have been at this place and continue to live a life of obedience. This is a lifestyle of long obedience in the same direction. I just want you to pray this prayer. I'm gonna give you the words, but the power comes when you say it from your heart. Would you say this? Say, Jesus. I need you. Lord, thank you for sacrificing your life for me. Jesus, I know that you lived the life that I was supposed to live. You died the death that I was supposed to die. You took my place. So Lord, my response to give you everything I give you my heart I give you my mind I give you my soul Jesus I believe you are the son of God you died for me you're coming back for me but until that day I'm gonna sing the song that never ends the song of obedience before you ask my answer is yes in Jesus name amen 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 come on if you meant what you prayed could you give God praise today come on y'all can do better than that can we give Jesus some praise today